if I may quote a, a great Jewish philosopher, Spinoza, uh, he once said that uh, peace is not the absence of violence, but the presence of justice. And I think that is a very good definition for how I look at peace. Hi, I'm Moritz, and I've been learning Hebrew with Matan for about half a year because I want to better understand uh, the situation and specifically the conflict in Israel Palestine. Hallo, ich bin ich heiße Moritz und äh, ich lerne Hebräisch seit einem halben Jahr mit dem Matan, äh, weil ich den Konflikt und die Situation in Israel Palästina besser verstehen will. Shalom, Korim li Moritz, we ani lomet Ivrit äh, im Matan milifne chetzi shana, ki ani äh, rotze lehavin et asich such ha Israeli Palästini tov yoter. Metsuyan, yefe. Actually. You know, it's interesting that you said Israeli Palestini and not Israeli Palestini, because you know that in Hebrew we have uh, the gesh on the pay in the beginning of a word, whereas in Palestine you don't have the the the, the letter p at all. Yeah, so yeah. It's Palestine. So yeah, yeah, I learned that. I learned that thanks to uh, Yair Netanyahu. Because oh, okay. I don't know if you remember his tweet where he said the reason why there can't be a Palestinian state is because in Arabic there is no p. Oh, <laughs> so smart of him. Yeah, so, so that's how you learned it. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, Moritz. So you uh, learned with me, with me Hebrew for, uh, for about half a year now. And yeah. now in a group with more people. And uh, we know each other through Mehara from Bait of Hope, where you interned. Can you tell a little bit about yourself? Uh, where were you born? What brought you to Israel and Palestine? Why do you learn Hebrew? Yeah, so I was born in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, which is also where I grew up, uh, in the suburbs of Zurich. Um, and I'm not Jewish nor Muslim, so I, don't, I wasn't necessarily born into the situation in Israel-Palestine. Um, and uh, however, you know, uh, I studied international relations um, in my bachelor's and my master's and I, I had always been following Israel-Palestine because, I mean, it's all over the media. I remember particularly in 2006 when I was about 13 years old, when there was the Israel-Lebanon war and that was on the news every night. And I remember, I mean, growing up in Switzerland, you're not very uh, much confronted with uh, war. And I remember that uh, I was genuinely afraid that that would be like World War III because it was the first time that I actually saw like war on TV. And, and, uh, and so you haven't heard about this place ever like... I mean, I heard about it. No, I mean, I've heard about Israel uh, because of the Bible, I guess. Uh, because, I mean, Jerusalem, everybody... That is, uh, everyone who grows up in one of the uh, Abrahamic religions, I think, knows about Jerusalem. So I knew about it. I, I knew that it was a place somewhere. Yeah. Um, I was always really into geography and stuff, uh, even as a little kid. So I knew about it, but I didn't know about, you know, the context. And then that kind of left an impression on me. Uh, and then I kind of just, you know, followed it, uh, not too intensely, but just, you know, regularly when it was on the news and so on. And then when I uh, was deciding on what to do my uh, bachelor thesis, that was in 2016, or late 2015, uh, my supervisor said, yeah, you know, there is this uh, international legal concept which is called condominium, which basically means uh, shared sovereignty. So in the sense that uh, state A and state B, or entity A and B, uh, together exercise sovereignty over a specific area and there was actually the proposal by one international lawyer back in the 90s to have such kind of arrangement for, for Jerusalem. Uh, so then I, I did my bachelor thesis on that. I looked specifically at, you know, what are the implications of shared sovereignty in Jerusalem? Is it feasible? Is it applicable? Uh, and then, I mean, it, it, I really delved in quite deep, I think, and I 
realized that this is what I want to focus my my studies on. And like over over the years, since four or five years, I've been following that path mainly. Um, I then wrote my master thesis also on Israel Palestine, specifically on the confederation proposal, which is propagated by a group called A Land for All, Two States, One Homeland, which uh, I actually had the pleasure to meet them uh, through Bait of Hope uh, last year. So I wrote my master thesis on that. Um, and then... What brought you... What, what's the, the personal connection? I mean, are you coming as a, as a total outsider, like very Swiss <laughs> kind to to look and in, uh, in a very kind of neutral way like the Swiss like Switzerland has always been neutral uh, I think what inspired me uh, was also um, how Switzerland is a very small uh, place and we have four different languages we have different religions uh, you know Protestantism and Catholic Catholicism and we have a very federal system and And this also origi- like this also developed over many centuries of conflict within and Israel Palestine in a sense it's also a very small uh, very small place uh, and there is a lot of tension and the people cannot coexist in a at the moment at least cannot coexist in a way where both genuinely enjoy you know equality and I think this fascinated me but but it, it was more on an intellectual level and and My personal connection to Zionism, I would say, is rather from European history because I, I mean, I'm, I'm a history nerd. I love European history, especially of the modern era. And uh, I mean, Zionism is inextricably linked to nationalism in the late 19th century and anti-Semitism in Europe. And therefore, I find as a Swiss or, or no, as a Swiss, I mean, as a person that values, you know, human rights and, and peace and uh, justice, I do think... That it's fascinating situation or fascinating I mean sadly fascinating yeah you know I'm kind of I, I like when people like internationals who don't necessarily have like a personal bond uh, as yourself are interested because we want people to be interested in what's happening and be involved you know we you know uh, Israeli peace activists or Palestinians as well but also it's kind of I don't know what I feel about you know you foreigners studying it and this being kind of like kind of exotic in a bad way ongoing conflict where everyone likes to research and have an opinion on uh, I like it and I dislike it and also there's something very Israeli in the way we look at you know Europeans when when a European even when you just said a minute ago you know I believe in justice and equality it's just like you You know they don't they cannot really understand and yada yada you know yeah I mean I hear that I heard that many times when I was in Israel how did you I think on what did people say and well how did you I, I personally think you know if you want to have an if okay so what you said before I think it's actually very important because I think everyone here is an opinion and that's not necessarily good however I My job is not to have an opinion, my job is to do, or my vocation is to do research in order to disentangle this mess, or at least help disentangle this mess. I mean, I have friends in Switzerland who are very much in the peace-building world, but not in Israel-Palestine, and they all have extremely, I would say, one-sided views, in a sense that then they call me as someone who says, okay, you know, we need to do actual peace-building, we need to find win-win situations. They call me a Zionist. Which I find quite ludicrous, because when I go to Israel, they all call me an anti-Zionist, um, which I, th- I think it's interesting because what I see my, my job as is not having an opinion necessarily. I mean, I do have an opinion, but it's more doing research and then contributing to kind of giving people also a more differentiated view, because many people have extremely one-sided view, but as you said, you know it's very the Israel-Palestinian conflict, it's very exoticized. It's very much also, I think, in the international public discourse because, because of Eurocentrism, because Israel culturally, I mean, there, there is a tie to, to Europe much more than other conflicts like Sudan, South Sudan, which is also a terrible conflict, but uh, it's not over, all over the media. Uh, and not everyone and has an opinion. There is a sense of responsibility by, you know, Britain and Europe because of the history. Yes. It's not necessarily a bad thing because it's like in the public discourse internationally, 
in terms of keeping the spotlight on it, it's a good thing. But however, I mean, I understand, like many Israelis that I spoke to when I was in Israel, they also told me, like, why do you have this obsession in Europe? Why do you have this obsession with Israel-Palestine? And I can, in a sense, understand it because if I were Israeli and this is my, you know, Israel or I, I grew up there, it's my home, I also would find it quite tiring that uh, to have, uh, you know, Westerners uh, or Europeans uh, and, and North Americans come in and try to lecture me. I understand that. And that's why I also am sometimes a bit, you know, uh, uh, even more like walking on eggshells in order to make a really to what, differentiated view. To what view. extent do you challenge them? Like, you know, I used to be pissed off by that when I was younger. And now I understand that it's simply that people from the outside can see much clearer. I'm on, I'm, of course, there's a lot of bias, etc. But it's easier to see when you're looking at this conflict from outside than, you know, living just a few kilometers from Ramallah or from Gaza and not knowing really what happens there despite the physical uh, short distance. Usually what I try to go into is whether they have actually been to the occupied territories because I think the vast majority of Israelis have not also because of course within the narrative it's con like it's considered dangerous and uh, all of these things and I mean I guess for an Israeli with a strong Hebrew accent, it's not Let's the best idea to go Let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation, okay? Like one of those that you had. Let's have a simulation. Yes. yes. Moritz, yeah, you're nice and everything, you know, but we are just tired of those Europeans like you who come to study, who come to tell us based on your... Like, who are you to lecture us, really? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I. I I think it's difficult to kind of try to delegitim delegitimize my perspective just based on that I am Swiss. Uh, rather, I think we should look at what's actually happening. And, and why don't we look at what actually happened? Where, where was Europe during the Second World War? Why should we listen to you now? Well, first of all, I'm Swiss. I wasn't involved in the Second World War. I think there should be no two opinions on Israel's right to exist. It absolutely has a right to exist that has been acknowledged by almost every country in the world. I, I think we should look at the situation in certain Palestinian cities and towns and that people there ha live in a very different reality than we do. I mean, we are, let's say, in Tel Aviv and we enjoy all of the, all of the freedoms that one can have. We can take a plane to the US, but the Palestinians that live 10 kilometers from Jerusalem, they are not allowed to go to Jerusalem. I mean. I understand that. Yeah, I understand. maybe if they wouldn't be so focused on planning how to build tunnels from Egypt and uh, focus on terror, then we can make peace with them. But that's not the case, you know. Well, that's I think not it's me really speaking. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I, I think I think it's I think it's uh, it's important to consider that narrative too. I mean, we definitely shouldn't blindly hail uh, Palestinians as uh, harbingers of peace. However, by simply delegitimizing every Palestinian as a potential security threat, we are really taking away any possibility of peace. Moritz, I'd like, to, I'd like you to, to shake people a bit more. I'd like you to, you speak very nicely and correctly, but I want, you know, sometimes I kind of expect that more from Europeans and like even European and British Jews you know, who, who, who kind of, you know, also kind of uh, implement these notions that, you know, speaking about, mostly about, about Jews, how, uh, you know, they're in Israel, they sacrifice their lives, la la la, we cannot talk to them, etc. But I like yes. you to shake Israel is more about what's really happening and what responsibility. You know, you spoke about privilege, you didn't say the word, but, you know, this is not a concept that we even speak about. Like, yeah, I, mean, I don't remember okay. speaking about privilege until I went to South yeah. Africa, really. I mean, let's look, at, let's look at some of the dynamics that exist in Israel-Palestine. For example, in, in the West Bank, the whole permit regime, it is a massive, uh, let's say, anti-privilege. Because let's say that I'm a Palestinian in the West Bank. If I have a car with a, with a white number plate, I, my mobility is extremely hampered. What about Palestinians? What do they... A respond to you to your perspectives and maybe you can also you know connect it to how your Swiss friends if there is any similarity who work in 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 conflict resolution call you a Zionist what are the, so, the responses 
with Palestinians, I think it kind of depends. There, there is a network of Palestinian peace activists that, that are not necessarily in the anti-normalization camp, that, that want to have uh, people-to-people peace building, they want to have meaningful ac- interaction between Israeli and Palestinians in order to, to like, tear down the destructive uh, narratives that exist. However, with some Palestinians, uh, yeah, the fact that I lived in Tel Aviv, the fact that I, in a sense, partake in normalization uh, through confederation, they see that as a, as a betrayal. For me, I see myself, I, I see my work towards peace. I don't take a side. I think we have to create some sort of a win-win situation or at least a win for Palestinians and kind of keep the status quo for Israelis, at least in terms of their privilege. I'm just tired not... of the word peace and you know... Yes. And, you know, that's how also politicians speak from the Zionist left, Israeli Zionist left, you know. But it's, it seems to me like such an old word, you know. During, yeah. in, in the days of Oslo, you could speak about peace, but you cannot even speak about peace because it's so uh, delusional. But peace, if I may quote a, a great Jewish philosopher, Spinoza, uh, he once said that uh, peace is not the absence of violence, but the presence of justice. And I think that is a very good definition for how I look at peace. Peace is not only that we don't have terrorist attacks. Peace is, uh, or peace is that there is justice, that there is equality, that there are equal rights and human rights. And I think that's what I'm, what I'm standing up for. And I, I, just, I just think that the dichotomy between Israel and Palestine, I do understand that the two narratives, the national narratives, are extremely important. However, I think from my perspective, this dichotomy of narratives has also contributed to the, st- to the situation we are in now, because they have become increasingly irreconcilable. And in order to kind of, you know, look at it in, in more pragmatic terms, I think we have to look at human rights. And of course, you know, Israelis will then say, oh, it means you're pro-Palestinian. It's like, no, I'm not pro-Palestinian, but, or, or I mean, I wouldn't, I, I don't have some sort of uh, personal conviction vis-a-vis the Palestinian na- national narrative, but I do see what is the status quo for Palestinians. And this is not, Justice, and this is definitely not peace. Uh, to the second part of the question, vis-à-vis uh, uh, people here. Vis-à-vis, um, how academic are you? Yeah, it's just uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, with regards to, and it's even more academic. Um, people here, I think you know they. For them, it's a, an activist cause. For me, it's also an activist cause, but it's also a research cause, and therefore. Like, there are two different debates. There is one debate, which is activism. How can we organize activism in Palestine uh, against the occupation and internationally also? And then there is the other debate about what can we do to actually deconstruct and get rid of these systems of segregation and oppression. And that second part is, for me, a, a debate that has to be led in a differentiated manner because if you start to say, oh, okay, Israel has an idea, it's, or the Israeli, the Israeli nation is... Uh, is is haram, <laughs> as they would say, uh, is, or in the, uh, is haram like it's it's you know it's it's bad in essence. I think that's that's uh, that's that's really not a, a good starting point for 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 a debate. You know what I mean? It's it's I, I I try to be differentiated. Like for example, let's take the BDS movement. I think on an activist level, the BDS movement is uh, doing many good things. Uh, maybe we will be, we will be put on canary mission after this podcast for even mentioning it. However. <laughs> uh, however, uh, I, I think like within like a you know research uh, and more differentiated view, I think we also have to consider like like what does it mean within the debate, and yeah, I mean in a sense like okay, I think now we've gotten to like to like the essence of this, uh, and in a sense, yes, the Israeli mainstream discourse has kind of moved the debate around peace away from, you know, being pro-Palestinian. And I see this even with myself. I mean, in Israel, uh, when I was working for the Swiss Embassy, for example, Swiss, Switzerland, Switzerland pursues, you know, humanitarian human rights. Uh, of course, this means investing much more in Palestinian civil society than in Israeli, because that is where human rights are in a dire situation. And the Swiss Embassy is continuously uh, shamed on the internet by NGOs like uh, NGO Monitor and... Uh, yeah. What's the other one? Uh, so yeah. does, the Swiss, does, does the Swiss embassy allow itself more than other European countries to speak harsh to Israel? Or mm. like to be front, to be unapologetic? I would definitely, like if you compare it to Germany or the UK, definitely yes. Why? Uh, well, Germany because of the history. 
Yeah. Uh, the UK, I think, because, I mean, in the aftermath, as, as was shown with the whole Jeremy Corbyn uh, situation, I think that a discourse in, anti uh, the discourse in, the, in the UK is that if you are vocally pro-Palestinian or pro-human rights, therefore pro-Palestinian in the views of pro-Israel people, you are running the danger of being called an anti-Semite. And I think that's why politicians and, and officials in the UK are, are much more hesitant. In Switzerland, that's much less the case because Switzerland considers itself, you know, champions of human rights, the, the, the place where the Geneva Convention was, uh, was, was signed and stuff. And therefore, I mean, if you look at the Geneva Convention, there are on a daily basis multiple violations of the Geneva Convention. And therefore, I think Switzerland also takes itself the right to say, look, this is not okay. And I think, yeah, more than other European So what kind countries. of terminology would, would... I don't know if you've been following, but, you know, I'm really interested also in terminology uh, because I think the occupation was a no word and today everyone's saying the occupation, the occupied mm -hmm. territories. But okay. would, it, would it promote boycott and settlement? Boycott and... Well, yeah, I think yes. However, I'm not sure how... I guess openly, but I'm not sure uh, how vocally they would. Do you know what's the policy today in Switzerland? I mean, for example, there are Swiss citizens that live in settlements. Today, or at least when I was there, they get uh, consularic and diplomatic protection from the embassy in Tel Aviv. This is a bit difficult because it's kind of a, a gray area because Switzerland, obviously, we only recognize Israel within the 67 borders, which is also why Switzerland has an office, a representative office in Ramallah. Why shouldn't they be treated by the consulate in Ramallah? Yes. Why, uh, why does Switzerland have to fall into the, the, the rules of Israel, which, you know, obviously is having people at the same place, at the same territory, and, you know, if you're Jewish, you are treated uh, by the Israeli uh, legal system. Uh, if you're Palestinian, then, you know, depends where you are. But, or, or by the army, if you're in Area C, right? But why does Switzerland have to follow suit? For Switzerland, it is a, a rather uh, stupid pragmatic reason. Because they would get more complaints if these people would have I to know. go to Ramallah. By, the, by those people who are Indian Swiss citizens. Who are participating in... Uh... In, in settlements, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, even when I was working there, there was uh, some people who were very adamant about that. We have to stop giving them consularic uh, uh, support. No, I can't go into too of much course, into that, but... Course, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a debate, and specifically uh, prior to the whole annexation uh, debate in Israel last spring, uh, that was even much more a debate. Look, I think for Switzerland, like, this is a, a rather a thing of pragmatism that they want to, you know, deliver yeah. a service. No, I'm just, yeah, yeah, it's understood. For example, you know, like... It's not for, such a big deal, I guess. Right. When I ask you, like, who, who said that in the embassy, I'm just wondering if kind of the fear of changing that to the uh, consulate in Ramallah, would it upset them or would it mostly upset Israel? And I hear, since I've been living in the UK, I, heard, I hear quite often this kind of fear of upsetting Israel. And, you know, I think there's always like this fear of maybe being too harsh on the way you condemn and the, the policies that are you know, anti-settlements, but Israel sees uh, and, and, and portrays it as anti-Israeli. Uh, or even anti-Semitic, which is, yeah, I think, course, the main which, problem. Of course. So I'm, I, I'm wondering, you know, this, I'm really interested in this because, you know, you don't want to piece off the Israeli embassy, right, with, with whatever you do. And, and that in itself, I think there's some, like, there's something about power there, there's something about bullying there's, there's this, you know, I'm so troubled by this, this fear. Don't upset the Israeli government. Like, mm -hmm. why not? I mean, how can you even claim to promote equal rights when you are afraid of upsetting the Israelis or the Israeli embassy, right? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, from the Swiss perspective, and I think many European countries have this perspective, uh, I think uh, it's important to keep in mind the following. So 
uh, on the department level, like at the Foreign Ministry of Switzerland, the Development Office of Switzerland, they have very clear uh, policies. They support a two-state solution. They support Israel within 67 borders. They support the creation of a functioning Palestinian state. They are against the settlements. However, on the high politics slash uh, parliament and government level, this is different because... Uh, I mean, we all have, Switzerland supports the creation of an independent Palestinian state. However, Switzerland does not recognize the Palestinian Authority as a state. And that is because uh, in order to recognize Palestine, the parliament would have to accept it. However, the parliament is much more, uh, I would say, pro-Israel. Uh, every year, for example, there is a social democrat a politician who makes a parliamentary motion on, to re uh, on recognizing Palestine, and every year it's rejected. Uh, and, Why? And even, because because uh, how Israel can Europe say that it's pro to state solution and always rejects to to recognize the state of Palestine alongside Israel? This is like unbelievable. I think that these same security uh, perceived security threats that are existent in Israel, in the in North America, and in Europe, they also they determine this. So politicians from the right to the center-left will be, no, we cannot recognize Palestine because Hamas, because, uh, because terrorism, etc. And I think this discourse... Yeah, as, if you are, as if you recognize a, a political party or a terror organization, if you like, you recognize a state. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of... A, it's, it's, yeah, I agree. It's a very stupid discourse in a sense because there is this uh, concern about the, you know, terrorism, especially since 9-11, it's gone up the, through the roof uh, with, uh, you know, tying Islam to terrorism. Uh, I think another issue is also, they say, ah, oh, we are for Palestinian state, we want it to be recognized, however, uh, the Palestinian Authority is not a state uh, because it doesn't exert sovereignty over any sizable chunk of land, which is kind of, uh, you know, it's a uh, egg and chicken question it's like okay we want the state dead end. but dead end it's dead a dead end. end like you run in circles basically it's a dead end. Moritz I'd really like to I mean you mentioned uh, Switzerland and your history as your point of kind of reference to the issue I would understand in the history of uh, you know of Belgium but can you tell me a little bit about how the history of conflict and divisions that you had in Switzerland is relevant and what happened? How did you solve it? Maybe mm -hmm. we can learn something from you, really. I think what we could learn from uh, Switzerland is how uh, different ethno-linguistic communities are able to coexist peacefully in a very small piece of land because we have the Swiss, we have the Swiss German uh, part, which is the majority and historically also the center of Switzerland, and then we have the uh, French and the Italian speaking parts. Um, plus, also uh, the religious divide between Protestantism and Catholicism it unloaded very violently in Switzerland, and uh, in a sense, it took wars in order for for politicians to then say, okay, we should not make this a matter of religion. Um, so I, how have you become so convinced in the confederation, the two states, one homeland, rather than two states or one state? I mean, confederation, it's more of, a, it's more of an idea. It's not a specific proposal yet. Um, but the confederation by uh, two states, one homeland, what they, what they envision is to have, for example, one uh, human rights court that stands above the, the two national governments that would deal with human rights issues and then also uh, environmental, uh, environmental agencies that would uh, make sure that there is a you know, mutually beneficial allocation of water, and, thing, um, water and, and, and natural resources. So, so how do we make the shift to challenge the, you know, the international community holding on to this dying or already dead years ago to state solution? Because... You know, I, I understood that as long as the Palestinian leadership doesn't change the paradigm that they don't support the two-state solution, and it's always the threat, right? They will say, like, hey, the Israelis are in charge of killing the two states, but they will never, like, say, okay, like, we are now really changing the paradigm, then no one in Europe will, will follow suit. So how do you think if this will happen, and how would it look like? 
Yeah, it's true. I, I do think the, in Europe the, and internationally in general, states are holding on to the two-state solution also because they're, I think, because they're not courageous enough to actually reevaluate their position. Um, and because, I mean, I do think there is one important thing that is in the two-state solution, namely that it enshrines the Palestinian right to self-determination. And I think that's very, very central. That's why I also think, I mean, it's okay in a sense that they, that they keep the paradigm of the two-state solution. To be honest, I think this will naturally change just because of the uh, continuing uh, occupation and the continuing... Uh, expansion of the settlements where at some point we will reach a state where literally it is not that different from the Bantustan situation where basically there will be enclaves of Palestinian demographics of Palestinian population centers and there will be no freedom of movement or not much freedom of movement for them uh, and the rest of the West Bank it will be Israeli settlements that enjoy the same privileges as those living in Israel sadly once the, once the international community can no longer lie to themselves and say this is not happening, I think then there will be a shift or then there, then there, will, be, then there will have to be a shift. Wait because other... for, a, for the worst to happen. I mean, I've it talked to... It won't be talked... better until it will be worse. It's true. I've talked to peace builders from Israel-Palestine and it's... Uh, I mean, yeah, they're, they're not very optimistic. Uh, multiple of them have told me, yeah, in a sense, it must get worse to get better. Um, Thank you very much, European countries, for playing uh, such a significant part in the game of status quo, in which you don't challenge yourself yes. to, to give other solutions than the two-state solution, but at the same time, don't recognize the, the much-needed part to be recognized. Yes. This is, Anyways. This is, this is, no, this is it's very frustrating, I know, but this is exactly the problem. I, I mean, I think, you know, there is grassroots work on bringing, you know, two states, one homeland, in, like to make them meet with politicians in Europe, to make them meet with Americans, to make them meet with uh, also uh, Israelis and Palestinians. But, but I think, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not a farce, but it's like a drop on a hot stone. It's, it's not enough yet. Uh, sadly, and now also, of course, with the current situation, Israel-Palestine is not so high on the agenda. So sadly, I think in order for it to become... Uh, to, to become a, a higher priority on, on Western agendas, the situation has to become more dire, and I mean, inev inevitably it will. But anyways, um, so something that I was amazed to know about you is that you are a, not only a history nerd, but also a rapper. So how does that work together? I just like to do it. I mean, I've always been musical. I like to speak my mind, and it gives me a platform to do that. Uh, what, was the sm what was the smartest rap uh, sequence you wrote? Share it with us. Um, the smartest. So, uh, in one song, I have a line which is, uh, the best lie that I know is that you don't have a choice. No one in the history of the world has had more of a choice than we do. Uh, and this is specifically about Swiss people because, or, yeah, Western people, because, I mean... I think no one in the history of the world has had so much privileges as we do, and yet we always tell ourselves that we cannot change nothing about the status quo because that's just how things are. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. Yeah. Um, would you like to try to rap in Hebrew? Oof, I, uh, I can try. Okay, I... let's try. So uh, we thought about a song in advance. Yes. Uh, Yom Shishi. Yes. Dag Nachash. So it starts like... Once again. Yeah. Yom Shishi. Yom Shishi higia vehu ba bedyupes man כמה שחכיתי כבר בעצם, למה שהוא מרגיע? והוא פה זה עושה סימן, שהלך עוד שבוע בשקט. יום שישי הגיע, והוא בא בדיוק בזמן. כמה שחכיתי כבר בעצם, למה שהוא מרגיע? ואם הוא פה זה עושה סימן, 
שהלך עוד שבוע בשקט. שוב שישי תפס אותי עם הלשון בחוץ, אחרי עוד שבוע שלחץ אותי לרוץ, עוצר את הכל סתום. וזה בא לי מה זה טוב עכשיו עוד לא שלוש בצהריים כבר נפתח לי הרעב נכנסים לאות ויאללה בוא ניסע עולים לירושלים לראות המשפחה שבת שלום, הגענו! יום שישי הגיע והוא בא בדיוק בזמן כמה שחיכיתי כבר בעצם, מה שהוא מרגיע, ואם הוא עושה סימן, שהלך עוד שבוע בשקט. So you can start rapping in Hebrew and start writing your raps, uh, you know, in German, in Swiss German and Hebrew. And I think it would be uh, uh, something uh, new and good for the world. Yeah, actually, on my last album, I had some Hebrew words. I mean, you know, very basic words. But, uh, like and, and what? Like Yala Besedach. <laughs> Yala Besedach. <laughs> Yala is like pure Hebrew, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yala, it's yeah. Uh, read in the Bible, no? <laughs> Sorry, we stole your language as well. No, I'm kidding. Hmm. It's integration. But, it's not stealing. Yeah. Anyways. Oh, Yala from the Bible. No, I, that was a joke. I don't oh, okay, think okay. so. <laughs> ya Allah, you know, it's Allah, it's God. Ah. Anyway. Anyway, so thank you for your time and uh, yes and um, anything you want to say to Israelis who might listen to us? Yeah, one thing that I would like to say is I think not only in Israel and Palestine, but I see it also now in Switzerland, that people are so unquestioning of their own perspective, and I think that's a very bad thing. Uh, it's important that we criticize ourselves the most. It doesn't mean we should become insecure and not confident, but we should criticize ourselves, our privilege, our perspective, precisely in order to become more confident of who we are and what we can do. And uh, I think that's, for Israelis and Palestinians, that's also very important. And uh, because only if we, you know, take away or try to take away our vantage point, can we actually you know, try to move together with the others to a vantage point that is more clear. Yeah. Hopefully I, uh, out of the dead end. Yeah. How do you say in English? Inshallah. Inshallah. In English. In English. In English. In English. Good. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day. שחיכיתי כבר בעצם למה שהוא מרגיע ואם הוא פה זה סימן שהלך עוד שבוע בשקל